Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 717 for August 2nd, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. And here we are. This is where you will enter into this experience. And I've, as you can see, we are very much under construction here. So I've got to be careful about where we can and cannot walk. It looks like the covered bridge experience where we will generally enter into the exhibit is blocked up because I think there's some floor work being done. Louisville's Fraser History Museum is a construction zone right now. At the end of this month, the museum will open a new permanent exhibition on the history of Kentucky bourbon, along with a new welcome center for the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. I took a hard hat tour the other day with the Frasier's Andy Trinan, and that's coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. We'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, the what I'm tasting this week department, and on behind the label, we'll ask the burning question, just how does one get the title of master distiller anyway? We'll get an answer from two men who clearly deserve that title, Jimmy Russell and the late Parker Bean. That's all ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Scotland's distilleries had another record year for visitors in 2017. The Scotch Whiskey Association released its 2017 tourism statistics Wednesday. Nearly 1.9 million people visited distilleries in Scotland last year. That's up 11.4% from 2016. And just to put things in perspective, it's up by 45% from 2010. Germany and the United States accounted for the most visitors, followed by India, China, and Japan. The Speyside area reported a major increase in whiskey-related tourism. The group Murray Speyside Tourism reports Murray had an increase of 50,000 visitors last year along the Malt Whiskey Trail. Meanwhile, there's a new whiskey trail along the western coast of Scotland. The 115-mile-long Hebridean Whiskey Trail was announced this week. It'll connect the four distilleries on the islands of Skye, Rassi, and Harris. That's Talisker, Torveig, Isle of Rassi, and the Isle of Harris distilleries. We have a lot of new whiskeys to talk about, and we'll start off with Jack Daniels, which officially unveiled its newest whiskey Wednesday night in New York City. It's a bottled-in-bond edition that will be available exclusively in travel retail at first, but master distiller Jeff Arnett is already dropping hints that it won't be exclusive to travel retail for long because of heavy demand from bartenders. Uh, you'll never hear a bartender say they want less proof uh, from you. They'll always say higher, the higher the proof the better because they, they see your product as one component of a cocktail. They, they have some intricate cocktails that they like to make, and by the time they have all the other ingredients balanced, they don't want the whiskey to have wilted. They need it, its character to still show up. So giving them 100 proof uh, as a bottled and bond product, I think, uh, is it, sort of a nice uh, uh, give, a give to this community that, that, in a way, introduces your product to people. Very, very few people come out of the box drinking whiskey neat, I've learned. Uh, they need cocktails as, a, as an entryway uh, into learning about whiskeys, and they'll ultimately choose the brands that they like based on probably, you know, for us, maybe it's a Jack and Coke, maybe a Jack and Ginger, or a whiskey sour that somebody used making Jack Daniels, and it's like, okay, you know, start dropping the mixers in it, let me just try the product by itself. Jack Daniels Bottled in Bond will be available in most major airport shops worldwide with a recommended price of $38 for a one-liter bottle. And by the way, Jeff Arnett is celebrating his 10th anniversary as master distiller at Jack Daniels. We'll have more of my interview with him on this weekend's edition of Whiskey Cast. It's been years since we last saw a new single malt release from White & Mackay's Fettercairn Distillery. 
Now, Wyden Mackay is relaunching Fetter Cairn with a new range of four whiskies, ranging from 12 to 50 years old. The 12 and 28 year old Fetter Cairns are available now in the UK. Both were matured in ex bourbon barrels. The 12 year old will carry a recommended retail price of 48 pounds. That's around 62.50 US a bottle, while the 28-year-old will go for around 500 pounds. That's around $650 a bottle at current exchange rates. The 40-year-old was distilled in 1977 and matured in ex-bourbon barrels with finishing in an Apostolus sherry cask. It'll sell for around 3,000 pounds. That's about $3,900 a bottle. And the 50-year-old Fetter Cairn dates all the way back to 1966 with a tawny port pipe finish and a price tag of 10,000 pounds. That's around $13,000 a bottle. Those two will be available by the end of August. Last time around, we mentioned Highland Park's new travel retail lineup on our Behind the Label segment. Now, the second edition in Highland Park's Valhalla series is hitting whiskey shops. Valknut is the sequel to last year's release of Valkyrie, and like Valkyrie, the bottle for Valknut was designed by Danish designer Jim Lingvild, while Gordon Motion created the whiskey that goes inside. When we put Valkyrie out, we really weren't sure how well it was going to be received, and we were uh, pleasantly surprised. So I really didn't have a tying in brief for the three of them to be a same sti- uh, similar style. Uh, there's going to be three of them released ultimately. Um, they really wanted to see, Jason wanted to see how the, the Valkyrie was received first before we decide on the, the next step. So yeah, it will still continue that heavily peated uh, theme, albeit a different underlying uh, mix of casks that are going into it. So a different, the, the heavy smoke will be there uh, slightly up on the last time Um and just a different style of cast coming in the background. Unlike Valkyrie, Valknut uses a higher percentage of sherry-seasoned American oak casks. It's bottled at 46.8% ABV and will sell for around 58 pounds in the UK. The U.S. pricing has not been announced as of yet. Meanwhile, Aberlauer is releasing its new Cask Anom single malt, it's a small batch whiskey matured in Oloroso sherry casks and bottled at 46% ABV. It's available now in Europe and other selected markets and will arrive in the U.S. this October with a recommended retail price of around $65 a bottle. Speaking of sherry, Johnny Walker has released a new variation on Black Label in Asia and Australia. Blender Chris Clark created the Black Label Sherry Edition by emphasizing ex-sherry casks in the blend. It carries a recommended retail price in Australia of $60. That's around $44 in the U.S. There are no current plans to release it in other markets, though. Also out of Australia, Sullivan's Cove is releasing a new double cask edition. It's a vatting of Sullivan's Cove malts between 10 and 17 years old, matured in a combination of American oak and French oak casks. It's bottled at 45% ABV and is available through the distillery's website for $220 Australian, which converts to around $162 U.S. dollars a bottle. Canada's Two Brewers Yukon Single Malt is releasing its first ever cask strength edition. It's the 10th bottling from the distillery in Whitehorse and is bottled at 58% ABV. It'll be available in Alberta, British Columbia, Yukon, and, if supplies last, Quebec. No word on pricing. Finally, let's acknowledge that researchers can get a study to find out almost anything. But a new report in the British Medical Journal suggests that moderate drinking in one's middle age might just reduce the risk of dementia later in life. The study of more than 9,000 people started more than 30 years ago. It found that those who abstained completely from alcohol were about 50% more likely to develop dementia than those who drank between 1 and 14 units of alcohol per week. By the way, a unit of alcohol is defined as the equivalent of a 25-milliliter glass of whiskey. 
so your typical airline size bottle would be two units. That's about the same alcohol as a pint of beer, too. However, the study also found that those who routinely drink more than 14 units of alcohol a week had a higher rate of dementia later than non-drinkers. The key, as with many things in life, enjoy your whiskey in moderation. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. Look for Highland Park's new line of travel retail exclusive bottlings at the airport the next time you're heading out on a trip. And if you're not traveling soon, look for the complete line of Highland Park domestic releases at your local whiskey shop. Find out more at Highland Park Whiskey. Dot com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. The Whiskey Show Melbourne is coming up on August 10th and 11th in Melbourne, Australia. Whiskey Fringe 2018 is the 10th through the 12th in Edinburgh, Scotland. And the Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh has a Glenmorangie and Ardbeg tasting on the 15th, followed by a White and Mackay tasting on the 16th. Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore, Maryland has its next Whiskey on the Waterfront Festival, August 18th. Tickets are still available for the Whiskey Guild's annual New York City Whiskey Cruise, August 23rd. And the Spirit of Alba Gin and Whiskey Festival is coming up on August 25th in Kirkintalloc, Scotland. The Stowning Whiskey Festival is also on the 25th in Stowning, Denmark. And the Bourbon Mixer is that same night in Louisville, Kentucky. Right now, we have 188 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival, a tasting, or other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form at our website to let us know about it, and we'll add it to the list. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place, and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. Aging at Gain Oak for 12 long years. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. At the end of this month, the Kentucky Bourbon Trail will have its first ever welcome center and official starting point at Louisville's Fraser History Museum. It's part of an ongoing partnership between the Kentucky Distillers Association and the Fraser, which is also about to open a new permanent exhibition on the history of bourbon in Kentucky. I was in Louisville last week for the Whiskey Summit, and after the summit's news conference at the Fraser, the museum's Andy Trinan and I went on a hard hat tour. We're standing on the sidewalk outside of the Fraser History Museum with Andy Trinan, the director of marketing, and there is an awful lot of construction going on around here. You're about a month out from opening this massive bourbon exhibit right five weeks mark but who's counting right uh, five weeks from today and we're really excited um, to be opening the kentucky bourbon trail welcome center in the spirit of kentucky bourbon exhibition we're uh, introducing a brand new entrance to the museum a public park that extends both above the entrance and through the back uh, that people can come and hang out while they're waiting for their kentucky bourbon trail tours to begin uh, and afterwards, so uh, yeah, this is a big, a big step for the Fraser History Museum, and we're really excited to take it. So let's go inside and see what's going on. Sounds good. So this is a new uh, glass vestibule entrance, and uh, we have a garden, a gorgeous garden, uh, kind of an urban garden that was uh, designed by John Karloftis, who has uh, done num numerous uh, stars in New York. He's kind of made his fortune designing difficult spaces where there's a lot of wind or bad weather uh, and making them very scenic and beautiful and as you can see he's done an outstanding job with this space right here where we're very close to the Ohio River it's essentially 19 feet across uh, and 180 feet back uh, it is 
uh, a building that burned down in 1917 and we've created it as this beautiful green space that people can sit, hang out, there are mirrors to make the space look bigger, uh, and uh, this is really uh, in the middle of the Bourbon District, uh, a really exciting uh, park for people to hang out in, and then it's also an event space for after hours. And the stonework and the brickwork is on both sides from where the building originally stood is a lot of the original architecture, right? Yeah, there's no question about it. This building burned down in 1917. It was the Ox uh, Breaches Breaches Factory. They made pants. It was the number one pants manufacturer. Um, and it sat essentially as a one level storage shed up until 2017 when we tore that down and decided to make it a new entrance. We had a little pop-up park here in the meantime and then just built this vestibule and, and the new entrance uh, as, as uh, really a grand opening uh, to the new project. And then you go from here straight into the visitor center for the Bourbon Trail, right? Yeah, this is uh, it, this people can hang out here as long as they like. They can also go up uh, on, during the opening uh, coming up. We're going to have a jazz band playing up top before the governor and mayor and the KDA are here for the opening. Uh, but then once you enter into the space, this is these buildings to our east are being developed. Uh, so look for restaurant partners, hotel partners, Bourbon themed. Uh, attraction partners over there and then when you enter into the uh, area to the west this is the Kentucky Bourbon Trail Welcome Center. That is a welding torch that's uh, putting together the centerpiece for the uh, Bourbon Trail Welcome Center. Uh, the sparks are flying off it. The uh, welding flame is bright blue. You don't want to look at it for very long. And this is still a space that it very much is being built out five weeks out, right? Yeah, the uh, new uh, wood floor is scheduled to go in uh, within the next week and the new admissions desk will arrive. The welding that you see there is a barrel roll. There are barrels that are coming from the, it's a photo opportunity, barrels coming from the ceiling and they roll down into what will be a, essentially a video kiosk where uh, guests will be able to come inside. We'll have a concierge service here so people can ask, you know, how much time, how much money do you have to go on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail? Where would you like to end your day? Uh, everybody's uh, situation is different. So we will have a concierge service here that understands nearby restaurants to the distilleries and all of those things. But also on this kiosk, people will be able to touch on the map for the Kentucky Bourbon Trail and say they want to touch uh, Four Roses or they want to touch Maker's Mark or Woodford Reserve or Jim Beam. And they will actually get a, a little 45 second uh, video with the master distiller from those attractions inviting them to come out and showcasing what makes that particular distillery special. And then the concierge service will help them go all over Kentucky, not just here in Louisville, oh, to get around wherever they want to go. Absolutely. This is about the entire state of Kentucky. Uh, obviously, Main Street and the Bourbon District has a rich, rich history here. Uh, but this is about driving tourism throughout the great state of Kentucky and the entire Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Uh, and we have partners as, as far away as Owensboro. I just visited O.Z. Tyler the other day. Uh, you know, Maker's Mark and Wild Turkey, uh, Northern Kentucky has a Kentucky Bourbon Trail presence as well. So, yeah, our, our job is essentially uh, there were 1.2 million visits on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. We believe those numbers are going to keep going up and up and up. And our job is to uh, take those bourbon tourists and show them what great things the state has to offer and entice them to go out there and learn more about uh, America's native spirit. We are at the western end of... Main Street in Louisville, Whiskey Row, going back 150 years or more. What was historic about the whiskey business down at this end? We know the old Forester and Brown Foreman were down at the east end back in the day, and that's where they've just opened up the new old Forester distillery. You've got uh, just down the block from us, Michter's opening up down here. You've got uh, Rabbit Hole down at this end. You've got Kentucky Peerless a couple of blocks away. 
What was big about the Whiskey End down here? Well, we're very close to where Evan Williams worked, uh, and, and, and they had, he was really the first. And uh, so the, the Evan Williams experience is here, and you can learn about, learn about that. He, he was also the wharf master in Louisville. Uh, this was where all the barrels came to and where a lot of blending happened in the day. These were all whiskey warehouses, thus Whiskey Row. And it's so exciting, Mark, to see this resurgence on Main Street, all the attractions you just mentioned, uh, because this is what's new. Everybody understands over the last 15 years what the Kentucky Bourbon Trail has been. This urban experience and resurgence on Whiskey Row is obviously some of the same audience, but also an audience who maybe is in Louisville for a conference and has a half a day. And we, what two distilleries can I knock out? You can go down to Old Forester and see an entire experience. You know, they, they char the barrels right there and, and they, they take it from beginning to end. So uh, a lot of great attractions and, and fun to partner with all these great folks. We probably shouldn't leave Angel's Envy out because they'll get upset if we leave them out yeah, too. Yeah, and Lincoln Henderson who started that uh, obviously uh, and started Woodford Reserve and, the, and they have such a great product and their tour I mean in you know our, our folks are learning uh, because it's our job to learn everything about all of those distilleries their tour is tough to get on I mean they are sold out if you think you're gonna walk up a day and get on uh, on an Angels Envy tour uh, you're sadly mistaken you're gonna have to go online and book those tours in advance uh, and, and they're they're really great experiences and if you can't get on that tour, you can get on the tour a couple of floors up in here, right? Absolutely. The spirit of Kentucky Bourbon Exhibition, and that's part of this whole thing. As these tours, because because they have limited inventory, right? They bring through 20 people a half hour, whatever. You can only get so many of those in a day if you're booked solid every half hour. So uh, our experience allows a bigger window. So say you're on the 3 o'clock tour at Evan Williams and you're on the, you know, you know the 1030 uh, at Michter's, uh, and you know, and you're on the first tour at Angel's Envy. What am I going to do in that window in between? Well, we'll tell you where you can get a good lunch, and we'll take you through the spirit of Kentucky exhibition. One of the exciting things about the exhibition, we're also going to incentivize people coming here because if it starts here, this is the official starting point for the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. So if people come here, they take their picture in the picture wall, which features every bottle of bourbon currently in production in the state of Kentucky, then they'll also get additional access. They'll get uh, discounts on upgrade experiences out on the trail. So your $12 ticket here may be worth $75 out on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. And we should point out that the Fraser is more than just a whiskey museum. This is really a museum about all of Kentucky history. If you may hear the kids in the background. But uh, this museum really shows off all of Kentucky history, right? Yeah, no question. Our, our brand is where the world meets Kentucky uh, because there are so many great stories about families, you know, history, culture, and industry, and, and bourbon is one of those industries. But we uh, we feature, we have Teddy Roosevelt's Big Stick and Geronimo's Bow and Arrow and Quiver, and we've got George Washington's Long Arm Rifle, uh, the, the Daniel Boone Family Bible, just some of the things. We've got more historic miniatures, more toy soldiers than any museum in all of America. So there's a, a great product strategy here. We will always have uh, other exhibits that fit into that brand. Right now we have a uh, magnificent Mona Bismarck who was best dressed woman in the world, voted that four different times. The first American ever voted to have that honor. She was in Vogue magazine 60 times. It's a fashion exhibit, but it's about a woman who's from Louisville, Kentucky that most people don't know anything about. We have reached the third floor. You might be able to hear the construction noise in the background. And, and here we are. This is where you will enter into this experience. And I've, as you can see, we are very much under construction here. So I've got to be careful about where we can and cannot walk. It looks like the covered bridge experience where we will generally enter into the exhibit is blocked up because I think there's some floor work being done. The hardwood that was done by Longwood really guides people all the way through the experience and it's it, you're basically going across a covered bridge but it's surround video sight and sound experience uh, and it's the, the great landscape of the state of Kentucky so it's Red River Gorge and Cumberland Falls and you know Keeneland Racetrack and uh, the Palisades just the beauty of the nature and the land it's not branded it's not about distillers it's not about making whiskey it's just about putting people in a beautiful place and for people who are from here giving them a sense of pride for people who are visiting 
an idea that the, the state has much more to offer than they've seen in just urban Louisville. We're looking at various things like uh, crime scene caution tape, uh, <laughs> blocking things off, but the floors are covered. Well, you wanted the tour, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just explaining. There's guys on ladders. We've got pieces of scaffolding. This, this is still weeks away, but you're going to make it in time, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I absolutely think so. In this area right here, this is uh, the Order of the Writ Room. So this is the, the secret society that, uh, for the KDA, Kentucky Distiller Association, in the highest order. But it's also where we will host Kentucky Distillers Association board meetings. So there is a, a version, a layout in this room where there is a, a board uh, a table that extends all the way across here. But as you can see, great classy bar here. So this can be used for event space, for cocktail hours, for some of our bourbon-related themed programming. And you can also have a dinner in here for about 40 people as well. We should point out that this very classy-looking bar is very classy-looking framework for a bar. This is the <laughs> plywood underneath that the good stuff's going to go on top of that will make it that very classy-looking bar, right? Absolutely. That is the hope. And you can see, you see the lights are classy now. You can see that there is a plan for classy. What's around the corner here? So, okay, this is, um, and we're, we're diverting around where your initial experience, which would have been that, um, that covered bridge experience, but there you see looking back at that. As you come across a covered bridge, you enter into uh, a great bit of natural light that comes from Main Street here. These big, big gorgeous windows will be open, and this is the water story. This is where it all begins. There will be a, a big map, John Filson's map, uh, John Filson, uh, who made Daniel Boone famous, but his map is of all the internal waterways in Kentucky. There are more internal waterways in the state of Kentucky than any state other than Alaska. And it tells the story of why distilleries were built where they were. Water is obviously an important ingredient in, as a source for bourbon, but also as a means of transporting it out for the, uh, for the rest of the world to enjoy. So there's also the boat story, paddle wheels. So what started as flat boats. Uh, as a way of transporting and became paddle wheels and barges and and now uh, our great you know UPS is transporting bourbon all around the world via air um, there is a, a literally a paddle wheel that people can turn for information uh, as they mine their experience uh, the Louisville Water Company is, is our sponsor in the water story and we are very excited uh, about our partnership with them after that, you, you come into limestone, and this is all in the Enchanted. This whole first chapter is about the land, it's about the grains, it's about the wood, it's about why 95% of the bourbon in the world comes from Kentucky. And, and really, that was a story of the land in the first place. It was a, this naturally filtered water because of the limestone. Uh, so we wanted to tell that story in a way that people can experience it. So you can see these limestone walls and fences that people can encounter and touch. There is uh, limestone stacking for people to get into ideas of how it's used in architecture, and you'll see architecture. Also, how limestone is used uh, to filter that water for our great Kentucky horse industry um, in the Lexington bluegrass. We've got strong horses whose legs look way too thin to hold the weight and, and run at the speed that they do. Part of that is because of the great water source that this limestone provides. We're walking through here, and if you've ever laid tile in your kitchen or your bathroom, you will understand a little bit of what's going on here because they're laying these great big three-foot or so by uh, three-foot tiles and grouting everything down to get the floor just right for this when it opens. And walking into the next room, there's a cement mixer, it looks like, and... Uh, all sorts of stuff. What's going on in this room? So this, uh, as we transition out of the uh, out of limestone, we'll walk into uh, the grain story, and of course, the over 51% corn. Everybody knows that about uh, Kentucky bourbon, the rye and the barley, and in some cases, wheat. It's a story about farmers. Uh, distilling is a way for farmers to repurpose uh, back in the day their crop and, and make, make money. A still is really a farming tool originally, so those stories are told here. Um, Independent Stave is uh, one of the sponsors of the exhibit, so you, you'll be able to build your own barrel. There, there are many barrels, uh, but you'll have the ironwork here and the wood, and you can stack and build your own barrels. Uh, there's a century experience here on the right where we will allow people to smell the common smells that exist in bourbon. So 
uh, charred oak will be one of the smells, uh, brown spice, vanilla, orange peel, the things that are commonly listed on the, the sensory notes and the tasting notes. And then if people want, the, you know, they say, oh, yeah, I get that. And when you go out and you try to match them at the distiller, you can actually buy those kits downstairs and in the museum store and take them out on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail with you and then say, oh, do you get that? Do you get this? And, the, and so it's just an experiential thing, and we're excited that uh, our guests will be able to to experience that so you're creating a whole new brand new generation of whiskey nerds here well that's you know because we all know about you know what happened to whiskey in the 80s and you know late 70s 80s 90s and and people turned to clear spirits these kind of things weren't going on so we are telling the whiskey story we are telling the bourbon story we are telling how you know how many jobs this industry is responsible for uh and um you know we we think that is an important part of keeping this rich and alive and obviously the distillers are putting as much uh whiskey in the barrel as they possibly can right now so they don't th they don't think this thing's going to take a turn for the worse anytime soon uh it's it's authentic and that's what makes it uh a great story in kentucky you can't go back in time and make it happen anywhere else it happened here it happened with these rich and colorful characters who weren't rock stars at the time. They were the guys that were running the distillery. And then now it's like they're ambassadors for the brand and they travel the world and sign bottles and speak at programs like we have here at the Fraser History Museum. We had one just last week you know, with Fred No and Steve Thompson and a local brewer. It's called a Master Series. And we will, um, once we get open, we'll be doing uh, some sort of bourbon program every week. Some of them will be simple bourbon education. Some of them will be bottle signing. Some of them will be speakeasies and master series we'll do a dusty bottle series that features vintage whiskey tastings and we're, we're very busy once we get this part of it done it's then getting people here experiencing it and uh, enjoying what we have to offer so we're walking into a fairly dark room here exposed oak beams I suspect, and we haven't gotten there yet, so I suspect this is probably the warehouse and maturation room. This is actually the gracious room that we've stepped out of the enchanted area, and you're right, it is darker. This whole experience gets darker as you go. It starts very light, like bourbon, which is clear when it goes in the barrel, and it gets darker with, the, with each chapter. But in this room it is the most impressive technology. This is the 24-foot table that is a huge content provider. It is a computer. It is lined in white oak. It has uh, oak seats around it, uh, and it allows 10 different people to put their hand on the tabletop, and there are stories floating in bourbon, and those stories are told uh, through history, culture, and industry. Families, obviously, involved in the uh, uh, in the, the story, and uh, it's really got some great technology, and we think it'll be a real repository for all of bourbon stories because all the distilleries tell their brand stories, and, and they're great, but this is a place that somebody can come to learn about all of it at once, uh, and, and it's all primary sourced information. Uh, and, and there's a, some really cool technological things, like if I'm talking about you know, a book or no, I'm reading about book or no on one side of the table, and you're reading about Parker Beam, that there will be a little cue that ties those two stories together and then you and I can say oh we can meet each other and talk about what those two people have in common. Which of course were family ties just distant relatives on the same beam family tree at various points. Yeah exactly and there were there were beams uh, as master distillers in essentially every distillery in Kentucky at one time except uh, Wild Turkey Parker Beam of course was a master distiller at Heaven Hill and was a cousin to Booker No. One of the things that uh, has been talked about a lot within the spirits industry the last few years has been telling the true story of whiskey and diversity, authenticity, and explaining, for lack of a better term, the role that slavery played mm -hmm. in bourbon. How are you going to tell that here, or is it going to be told here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is an important part of the story and there's no question it has to be told here look we are innately a history museum um, and history uh, when it's told now is different than when it was told 50 years ago and 100 years ago but part of the success of every museum is telling it from all angles and uh, because all angles are your audience first of all because you should and it's the right thing to do 
But if you're only telling the story from, you know, a 60-year-old white guy's perspective all the time, your audience has, is not very vast. Uh, those were important people in the industry, um, in, in all industry, uh, and those stories absolutely have to be told. And that is overall uh, the philosophy of this museum, not just when it comes to uh, bourbon. How are you going to tell these stories with uh, regards to the whiskey industry? Well, there's, uh, there are a number of, we'll tell them through people. Um, Elmer Lucio, Lucille Allen is a woman who uh, worked at Brown Foreman, African-American woman uh, who was the first chemist, uh, first African-American chemist, uh, the first manager at Brown Foreman. Uh, we have done a long oral history uh, with her, and she will be featured uh, on the gracious table. Uh, it's part of the culture of this industry and she was an outlier at the time um, but you know African Americans have played a key role uh, and we are as distilleries are starting to share more of those stories we are starting to share more of those stories we uh, do have all the distillers as partners um, so we don't want to tell a story that they are not telling. So it's, it's a partnership and it is a way uh, as they're working through and uh, managing those, we are as well. But there are, you know, a vast number of stories that, that need to be told and we're anxious to tell them. This exhibit will evolve over time as more of these stories become researched, verified, and can be told. Right? Well, it's a great thing about the Gracious Table is we control all the content on that table, and it will be 500 and some stories as it first starts, but we can add to it. Uh, we control that content completely here within, and, and as people come through and have experience, as they share, you know, you'd be amazed, Mark, how many people call and say, oh, you, you got to hear this story. And then, so we have a team of... of uh, curators that go out and you know authenticate those stories sometimes they come with artifacts sometimes they don't uh, and they become uh, you know part of the display here at the museum and uh, that's the exciting thing about it and you have to bring in again all cultures of people uh, who had a hand in it because if we're going to be successful all of those people have to have uh, pride in it you know and and uh, it, it's a part of Kentucky's uh, culture and history. We tell stories. We want to tell good stories. So what is this room? We're walking in through a brick entryway. There's a big round fixture that I suspect is a light fixture hanging from the ceiling only because I can see the rendering of what it's supposed to look like and there's light coming out of the bottom of it so I'm betting it's a light fixture. You are so perceptive. Uh, this hey, is I grew up in a construction <laughs> family. I can read a blueprint. This is the refined room, and this is uh, the, the, the story of responsibility will, will be told here, uh, but also uh, the stills, uh, what, a, what a craft that's become. You know, the, everybody's now showcasing their stills, these beautiful stills, column or pot stills that the different distillers use. Um, decanters through the years, bottling and how bottling has changed. Uh, the responsibility story will be told here. It's, of course, you know, how do we enjoy our Kentucky bourbon? We enjoy it responsibly. Um, and, and this room will also allow us to showcase some of the great branding that's done over the years. Um, you know, what kind of uh, signs, ads, posters were used in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. It's fun for folks to look back at that. It will also allow us to have the, the, the gracious table that I told you about is not only a content provider, but it's also a means for us to see what people are most interested in. So, because it's a computer, we can see what searches people are engaging in the most, and then we can say, okay, well, we should do another more comprehensive exhibit about that. So this room will be able to, in these back two corners, do a temporary exhibit, say we wanted to do something with UPS about transporting bourbon around the world, or we wanted to do something with Vendome about still making. Uh, this will give us the opportunity to do those kind of things. Here, as we leave the refined area, um, you will enter into a photo op, and this is a bottle wall featuring every bottle of bourbon currently in production in the state of Kentucky. So we're over 500 bottles. You can see uh, the cases around where the bourbon will sit. This is the darkest room. The only light in here, all of these bottles will be backlit. So when you walk in here, this will be an, it'll have an amber glow to it. 
and this is what I told you before, when people take a picture of themselves in this bottle wall, they can then go out on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, show the distillers that they were here and they have this picture, and then that will trigger either discounts or additional access or uh, additional experiences that they couldn't have had otherwise. Let's emphasize, just for transparency's sake, that we can actually see through those cases right now because they're not installed yet. Um, <laughs> We are still obviously five weeks out, as you've said. And right now we're looking at a bunch of gray sheetrock and exposed wiring in a lot of places. So this is part of the area that still has to be built out, but you're doing a great job of describing what it's going to look like when it's done. And, and, and uh, you know, I apologize for that. And, uh, oh, we don't need I to ask, apologize. Ask for people to be creative, and you're making me a little nervous because, yes, we're five weeks away from this thing, and... and uh, we would love to think that the, that this looked much more farther along. The thing is, the bottles are all here. Uh, most of the dirty construction will be done within the next two weeks. A lot of the casework and things are being built off-site, and they'll be brought in once we have a clearance from the dust. Oh, of course. <laughs> it's like but any you are making uh, me nervous. <laughs> well, no, I grew up in a construction family, as I've said before on the show. So I've been through job sites, and I've seen what it's like with a few weeks to go, and... You think you're never going to get there, but you do. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, we are. We we have already passed a couple of major hurdles that uh, that we wouldn't have gone public with an open date if we didn't cross those. Uh, so we're we are pretty confident. And we're excited. We're actually scheduling. Uh, media days we're scheduling industry days this actually you just walk through what will be a trick door so this is the bottle wall that continues here mark and then if you touch a certain place on this wall it opens up and you open up into this speakeasy where we'll have bourbon programming we'll have bourbon performances we'll have sometimes tastings we'll have we won't have bourbon tastings for the everyday visitor coming through the exhibit but when we have groups coming through we have events we'll have tastings in here otherwise people may be tasting uh, L8, which is a Kentucky product that came out during Prohibition, or they might be tasting small batch bourbon truffles from Art Eatables, um, because we think that you know touching things and smelling things and tasting things is a part of the overall experience and an important part. This is also an event space that people can rent, as is the Order of the Writ Room, for after hours uh, experiences. You can rent the entire floor, you can rent just the speakeasy, you can rent the speakeasy and the exhibit, or you can rent just the uh, Order of the Writ Room and the exhibit. How much demand has there been already for this space? I would assume that uh, a few Kentucky bourbon fans would probably want to have a wedding here. There's no question about that. And it's actually why we, we had a speakeasy with our previous exhibit. Our first partnership with the Kentucky Distillers Association was Prohibition in Kentucky, uh, Spirits of the Bluegrass, which is now featured at the Oscar Getz Museum in Bardstown, Kentucky. Our partners, they, we, they was really successful. We didn't have room for it anymore, so we decided to... Uh, offer it to them and they were recreating their experience so they have that exhibit on display but that speakeasy that was in that exhibit was such a success from a business standpoint uh, it generated hundreds of thousands of dollars in rental space that people people get the speakeasy era you know women love dressing in that era guys love dressing in that era uh, you know the cocktail culture there was very interesting uh, so, yes, we've had a great deal of demand and decided that we needed to have that speakeasy option as we open the new Spirit of Kentucky exhibition. What do you think this is going to do for bourbon tourism in Kentucky? We've talked before and reported before, Mayor Fisher here in Louisville has promoted this bourbonism concept of bourbon-related tourism, food and drink, hospitality, and now education. What is this going to do for Louisville as far as becoming even more of a bourbon hub compared to other parts of the state and making Kentucky a, a real hub for whiskey tourism. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, because there's been such progress in those things that you mentioned and because bourbon tourism, bourbonism has become a, a thing, it, we were able to do this. And uh, we have told all of our partners that our job here is to only improve upon what they're doing and we think that we can absolutely do that. Uh, bourbon tourism is an important part uh, of Kentucky culture now. Like I said, it is authentic. How much can we grow? I mean, I think there is an awful lot of growth to be done. Right now, the bourbon market is about one-tenth of the brown spirits market in the world. And it's booming, right? But if we doubled our capacity, 
we would still only be at 20 percent of the potential market so uh, the story just needs to be told to more people and that's our role our role is to share the story uh, about the interesting families and in, in the culture and in the industry and uh, in turn uh, create more Kentucky bourbon fans the Welcome Center and Spirit of Kentucky exhibit will officially open to the public August 30th. There's a link for more details in our show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the classic Lagavulin 16-year-old, the Distiller's Edition, and the throwback 8-year-old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start with the new Jack Daniels Bottled and Bond edition we talked about during the news. I got to taste it during Wednesday night's release party in New York City. Of course, it's bottled at 50% ABV, and the nose has notes of cinnamon candy, orange marmalade, honey, cooked banana, and just a hint of vanilla. The taste is spicy and intense with cinnamon, black pepper, and orange marmalade, along with hints of brown sugar and molasses that come out as the spices start to fade. Adding some water brings out touches of dried fruits, and the finish is very long and spicy. I'm scoring the Jack Daniels Bottled in Bond Tennessee Whiskey a 93. Alpine Distilling in Park City, Utah, uses Old Jack Daniels barrels to mature its Traveler's Rest American single malt, then finishes the whiskey in new toasted French oak barrels. Traveler's Rest is bottled at 44% ABV, and I brought home a sample from Tales of the Cocktail recently. The nose is malty with notes of coffee beans, dark fruits, muted spices, and a slight hint of campfire smoke. The taste has that same campfire smoke note, along with barley sugar, a nice oakiness, and hints of tree fruits, vanilla, and caramel for a nice balance. The finish is medium length with just a kiss of smoke and hints of tree fruits. I'm scoring the Alpine Distilling Traveler's Rest Single Malt an 89. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, proud to announce the 2018 edition of Parker's Heritage Collection. This year's edition carries on Parker Beam's legacy of excellence and innovation with a unique bourbon finished in orange curacao barrels that accent the bourbon's own natural hints of citrus. Once again, sales of this year's edition of the Parker's Heritage Collection will benefit the ALS Association. Find out more at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. I received a sample this week of one of Highland Park's new travel retail bottlings. Wings of the Eagle is a 16-year-old single malt. It's bottled at 44.5% ABV. The nose is fruity and sweet with a slight touch of smokiness, mild spices, honey, dried fruits, and oak. The taste is thick and fruity with apples, a hint of citrus, apricots, and honey, along with nutmeg, white pepper, and allspice. The finish has lingering fruity notes and just a touch of oak. And I'm scoring Highland Park's Wings of the Eagle a 92. Finally, the Whiskey Fairy also delivered a sample the other day of the new Johnny Walker Blue Label Ghost and Rare Port Ellen Edition that we mentioned last time around in the news. This one is bottled at 43.8% ABV, and the nose is fruity and vibrant with a hint of smokiness and a slightly herbal touch of mint. The taste has a good balance of fruitiness and smoke with grilled pineapple, vanilla, orange marmalade, and subtle spices. The finish is long with lingering fruits, soft smoke, and an aromatic touch of spearmint. I'm scoring the Johnny Walker Blue Label Ghost and Rare Port Ellen Edition a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,250 different whiskeys 
at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Lestow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Lestow edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. Our last episode's coverage of the Whiskey Summit in Louisville included a photo of the plaque that was placed by the tree that the leaders of the nine major whiskey trade groups planted outside the Fraser History Museum following the summit. Now, here's what that plaque reads. On 26th July 2018, representatives from the world's largest whiskey producers and trade associations gathered at the birthplace of bourbon to plant this white oak tree in celebration of the industry's success, sustainability, and continued commitment to collaborate to preserve free and fair trade. Now, Jesse Tampio of Washington, D.C. added this postscript on our Facebook page, quoting now, And then we will cut down this tree, make it into barrels, and sell a special Whiskey Summit edition aged in those barrels for an unreasonable amount of money. Well played, Jesse. But let's face it, that would take 80 years or so for the tree to mature. And it turns out that the tree is actually planted on a very busy street corner, And that planter gets hit by a car or truck at least once a year. In fact, before the briefing even started, there were already jokes being made about starting a betting pool on how long the tree lasts before it gets hit. I shared my tasting notes a few minutes ago on the Johnny Walker Blue Label Ghost and Rare Edition. I mentioned this one on social media last week when it was announced, and Leonard Sandoval at LJ Sandoval 1981 on Twitter responded with... Forbes magazine said the price is going to be $350, which is about $50 less than the first edition of Ghost and Rare. I was going to buy a bottle of the John Walker and Sons King George V, but I may wait to buy this instead. Well, for the record, that's the price we reported for it as well. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. Or look for us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close the show out now with Behind the Label, our look at the science, history, and other stuff that make whiskey unique. Now, titles look really good on a business card, no matter what business you're in. If you doubt me on this one, look at all those bank branch managers with vice president on their business cards. Reporting, of course, to regional vice presidents, senior vice presidents, executive vice presidents, and so on up the corporate food chain. Of course, the whiskey industry is no exception. Back in the day, distillers were just that, distillers. The boss might have the title of head distiller or distillery manager, and it's the same thing on the blending side, too. But gradually, title inflation reached the whiskey business, and we started seeing the terms master distiller and master blender. Just how does one get that title? Well, there is no certification process. You will not get a degree from Harriet Watt University, UC Davis, or any other college that decrees you a master distiller, even if you earn a master's degree. Usually that title comes from the marketing department. For instance, Jim Beam cites seven generations of master distillers on its labels, but it is fair to say that the term really wasn't even used until the Booker No era, in Generation 6, and applied retroactively to his ancestors. In some cases, the distiller is also the distillery's owner and founder, and we've all seen cases 
where a small business owner puts CEO on their business cards. So you can usually guess what that means. Back in September of 2015, I sat down with the late great Parker Beam of Heaven Hill and the equally great, very much still with us, fortunately, Jimmy Russell of Wild Turkey, two men who really earned the title of Master Distiller with decades of experience and hard work. Did you ever think 50 years ago, plus when you both got into the distilling business, that you'd be regarded as rock stars when you go out on the road? No. I mean, people show up, when they hear that you're going to make an appearance somewhere, people drive hundreds of miles to see you two. I think the recognition came about with the single barrel products that, you know, that we, you attach those to the master distiller's work of art. Because that single barrel has to be good, it can't be any other way, you know. And that's when the, really the master distiller name came into play, I think. That was one of the things, you know, back 25 or 30 years ago, there was marketing salespeople out in the field all the time. And our company decided they wanted me to go out in the field. Now we have, from it being actually from the production making the end of it, there was nobody out there like that. And then we all started going out and saw what a big, people began to realize what a big difference it was from marketing sales to actually people was making it every day. One of the things I have said when people like to give themselves the title of master distiller, And my common retort is, okay, I want you to walk into a room with somebody like Parker Beam or Jimmy Russell or, say, a Jim McEwen of Brook Lottie or some of the great guys in Scotland and say, and introduce yourself as a master distiller. And if they don't either punch you or laugh at you, then you probably earned the title. Right. (laughs) Correct. Uh, Yeah. It's uh, it's hard to tell some of the questions I could ask. And I'm sure a lot of them couldn't answer those in a proper way. Yeah. What defines a master distiller to you, too? Well, you know, go ahead. You know, Jim. Well, you know, and keeping true to your thought, way you want it, want it to taste out into what people like and enjoy the percentage of grain, the cooking temperatures, the distillations, all that your yeast and everything, making sure it's consistent. That's the main thing that we strive for, I strive for, and taught my son and Parker the same way, to be consistent today, tomorrow, eight years from now, 10 years from now, whenever he gets to market, we want the products to be consistent in taste and flavor and all. That's something you strive strive for, being a master distiller, doing everything the same way every day, day in, day out, because you don't know where that product's gonna wind up, or is it going to be a single barrel? Is it? And when it comes off the steel, you never know. Ten years from now, eighteen years from now, six years or whatever. What? So it all has to be consistent, and the product has to be good when it flows off that steel every day. You can watch the entire Whiskey Cast HD interview with Parker and Jimmy on YouTube or at WhiskeyCast.com. By the way, there is one other way to earn the title of Master Distiller. The Karakasevich family at California's Charbet Distillery has passed that title down through the family for 13 generations, going back to their days in Europe. Marco Karakasevich spent 26 years working for his father, Miles, before he received the title, only by becoming as good as or better than his father at distilling and creating a unique whiskey with Charbet doubled and twisted. You'll find my tasting notes for it at the Whiskey Cast website. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast. There's a new episode out now, by the way. It's brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, events, and much more, including a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We continue the cask strength conversation all week long online. 
Look for us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you twice a week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening. <laughs>